Welcome back to Random Book Club Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Van. With me today is special guest, indie author, Justin Mason. Justin, great to have you back with us. Great to be back. You know, I got to say it. I, I just got to say, this book has been a banger, Dad. I'm ready to get into it. All right. Chapter 7, Spire Albion, Habble Morning, Ventilation Tunnels. Summary. Grim strode toward the Spire Arc's manor his booted steps striking the stone floor with sharp, clear impacts, and reminded himself that murdering the idiot beside him in an abrupt surge of joyous violence would be an extremely bad taste. I love that opening paragraph, Dan. Let's be real, dude. We're that back with Grimm. We're back with yeah. Grimm. And we're back to being hilarious again. Yep. <laughs> he's obviously not happy with the guy he's walking with. Uh, no, he's not. It gets you right into it. You're walking, so you're already feeling like motion's going on, and you also don't like this guy, so you, you want to see how... Well, like, first of all, Grimm's back in Spire Albion, so good. He got to dock somehow with the fucked up ship that he had, and yep. now he's on to business, but obviously he's doing business with someone, so let's get this in. This other person's got some other plans. Take, it, take us home, Dan. Perhaps her time has come, said Commodore Hamilton Rook. He was a tall, regal-looking man, provided one desired a monarch whose nose was shaped like a sunhawk's beak. May I say that you get the description of a tall, regal-looking man, but let me read this to you again. Perhaps her time has come, said Commodore Hamilton Rook. That name right there gives you a sense of grandeur, mm -hmm. uh, royalty. Remember the Pirates of the Caribbean movies yep. where they have where uh, they meet the one real fancy guy that's supposed to marry Elizabeth, and he says, Commodore! Remember that? Yep. Remember him? Every time he's addressed as Commodore, you're reminded that he's just a step a up. Little bit, a little bit uh, above everybody else. I like that. I really like um, what Butcher did here. That was really cool. His black hair was untouched by silver, which Grimm was certain uh, was an affectation, meaning he dies it. Affectation is fake, you know? Yeah. His face and hands were weathered and cracked from his time aboard his ship, a battle cru a battle cruiser called Glorious. Glorious! I won't give in, I won't give in till I'm victorious. God, it's so good. A peer of Itasca, if not even remotely her rival. So what, is the, what are they saying there? Uh, so the Commodore Rook is the Commodore, the captain of the ship Glorious, and... It's a peer of Itasca. So we had talked about this off cast here before, and I was a little wrong. I said that they're on the same level. They're peers as in they fight in the same fights and stuff like that, but they're not rivals in that Glorious can't step up to Itasca. So Grimm was able to do something that Rook hasn't really. Isn't? So, you know, when you read that, Look how much information we get about these two captains, Commodores, whatever, before we even get real interactions between the two. Uh, here's uh, here's Grimm with his nothing ship, his winless almost, mm -hmm. his nothing irrelevant little vessel taking on Itasca. And here's uh, Rook with this ship that's supposed to be so much better can't even can't even go toe-to-toe -to -toe with it it's a po it's a proper battle cruiser all right so his <gasps> his fleet uniform was proper deep blue accented with an unseemly amount of golden braid and filigree and bore three gold bands at the end of each sleeve what say you my good francis so we get a name reveal here Ooh. Grimm's first name is Francis, and Commodore Rook continues to chide Grimm by asking if he should use his middle name instead, uh, his middle name being Madison. Grimm almost loses his cool. He feels the fingers on his sword hand tighten, then relax, and he calmly reminds the Commodore that he is well aware he prefers Grimm. So they're starting off with, we've got... Rook basically saying, hey, so what do you think about the deal or whatever, uh, Francis? So there's a, there's a, what do you call it? Like, they know each other. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If yeah, you know someone's a, first name. Really so you get the feeling that they're old, they're old, like, fleet buddies or something. 
Yeah. Maybe they had a falling out previously. And the fact that he knows his middle name, too, to continue teasing him. And but it doesn't come off as like playful teasing. It comes off as kind of mean. Comes off as uh, Rook is being a prick, yeah. basically, for lack of a better term. Because not only does Grim, this badass that we know him as, have the first name Francis, which can be interchanged with a female name. You know, some people yep. Yep. tease Fancy. people like that. My father-in-law's name is Fran. We just call him Fran. You know, his name is Francis, but he's a tough wood outdoor woodsman. You know what I mean? He's got a wood shop and obviously doesn't care that his name is Francis. But not only that, now you got Grimm's middle name, Madison, which is also somewhat feminine, you know? Madison I hear more as more as a woman's name than I do as a man's name. Yeah. So uh, it's, a, it's like a double jab. Anyway, uh, Rook pushes one last time by stating that they might as well call him Captain as though he still had a true commission. Oh, so he does know him from the fleet. We might as well just call you Captain then, if you know, if we're choosing names, as if you have a real commission. Grim reminds himself that murdering Rook right now would be an extremely bad taste, no matter how joyous. So we get that, uh, it's like a callback from the very first lines. You get internal dialogue, yep. and it's hilarious, but at the same time, you get the sense that Grim is not necessarily joking about smoking this dude. Yeah. And it really shows like how much like proper etiquette is important in this world. You can still have real human, re you know, feelings and stuff like that, but he's, he's keeping his cool. And we've seen that in previous chapters as well. Mm -hmm. Then Rook prods on with business, telling Grimm that he hasn't responded to his generous offer yet. The pair turn down a side corridor out of the main traffic of Habel morning. Grimm responds by saying Rook's offer to scrap Predator for a quarter of her actual retail value was a bad joke. Rook <laughs> tries to persuade him by giving him the hard facts. Predator is outdated as a warship, undersized as a trade vessel, and with the money he is offering Grimm, Grimm could buy a quality merchant vessel that would make several fortunes in no time. Now, aren't we about to find out Rook's real intentions, though? Mm-hmm. Grim calls because, him out. Yeah. Grim calls him out by stating the fact that his house would get a hold of Predator's core crystal has nothing to do with it. No, of course not. Why, why would you think that, Dan? Then we learn a little bit more about core crystals in this world, their worth and their rarity in this time. So this is from the book uh, explaining about crystals and stuff. Crystals of suitable size and density to serve as a ship's power core were grown over the course of decades and centuries. Core crystals were not expensive. They were priceless. In Spire Albion, all current crystal production was under commission to the fleet, leaving a set number of core crystals available to private owners, most of whom would not part with them at any price. Over the past two centuries, the great houses have been steadily acquiring the remaining core crystals. Certainly, they could have had, uh, they could have, they could be had from other spires. But so far as Grim knew, no one in the world could match the power or quality the crystals that Lancaster produced. There's so a more background information for us about our previous characters. Yes. Yeah, so Gwenny Lancaster of House Lancaster. <laughs> The Crystal Girl, apparently for the past two centuries, her family has been making the qualityest, the bestest core crystals in all the world, which is pretty cool. And apparently Grimm has one. Somehow the Predator has one. So Rook admits that it would help his house, but the offer is honest nonetheless. Grimm quickly declines. He just like, nope, no thanks. Like, Rook's like, yeah, dude, I mean, yeah, that would be a sweet boon to my house. But I am being honest. I'll give you money. So then you can buy a real ship and, like, real crew and shit like that. And he's like, nah. So now, uh, getting a little agitated, Rook declares that he will double the offer. And Grimm says, no, twice. I liked how he said that in the, in the, in the dialogue there, where he actually says, no, twice. As in, the second time, bro, we don't want your offer. So I kind of laughed out loud at that. Uh, Rook now seemingly feels he has no other option than to intimidate Grimm. So now we've, we've been bartering up until this point, but now he starts to do the intimidation. Stepping out in front of him and halting. 
Rook begins by saying he means to have that crystal. That's that is his goal. Like you just said, we kind of learn his true thoughts on it. Yeah, he wants to scrap the ship for Grimm and give him some cash, but that crystal is going to be his one way or another. I so, can pursue it in the courts if need be. Exactly. And he lists I love off... how he, he... You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of somebody desperate to get what they want immediately. To, I'll sue you. I'll, I'll sue you. I, oh, I hate... And probably like used to getting their way in this oh, manner. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. For he's giving, sure. you know, he's giving him kind of the benefit. Of, he's giving Grim kind of the benefit of the doubt, probably because they're old fleet buddies and stuff. Like, hey, here's the deal. I'm going to cut you a small check to cover the cost of the scrap. I'll take your crystal, but you can, with this money, you can buy a mm, merchant vessel, make yourself fortunes. Come on, bro. We're all buddies. No. Okay, I'm willing to do double, bro. Hardball? Okay. Friend discount? Or friend added it here? Okay, we can do that. No, twice. Now he gets to the point where he's like, okay, I'm going to treat you like everybody else. Can I tell you what this says to me about Grim? Because we've already seen, we've seen him offered double. 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 Half the value of the actual ship. Fine. Like normal. He says, no. I'll tell you what this tells me. Grim doesn't have a price. He can't be bought. Price less. Yep. Can't be bought. Loyal to the bone. That's what this tells me about Grimm. Without knowing anything else about him, if I only ever read this chapter, I would be able to discern that about Grimm just from this. And that idea of theme gets validated as we go on. Yep. He can't be bought. That's my thought. So, um, Rook begins by saying that he means to have the crystal. And then list off the reasons why it makes no sense to decline his generous offer. Rook has seen the damage reports and knows that Grimm has no way of re- affording the repairs. She's wounded, Grimm said firmly. Not a derelict. Wounded, Rook said, rolling his eyes. She can barely limp up and down the side of the spire on a tether. Predator isn't an airship any longer. She's barely a windless. Ooh. We got chapter. Okay, so... So, or not chapter, we got title. the book's in title, the, Windless. Words, yeah. And I was like, is that a thing in this world? Like, is a Windless a thing in this world? Well, it's actually a thing in our world, guys. I'm an idiot, so I looked it up on Google, on the on the secrets of the internet. And from Wikipedia, the Windless is an apparatus for moving heavy weights. Typically, a Windless what? consists of a horizontal cylinder, which is rotated by a turn of a crank or belt. A winch is affixed to one or both ends, and a cable of... A cable or rope is wound around the winch, pulling the weight attached to the opposite end. So it's basically like a pulley system, just to lift heavy shit. Um, so now, okay, can we digress a little bit? What the heck does the Aeronauts Windless mean then? If the title of the book is The Aeronauts Windless, is this referring to Predator? Because, like, okay, Rook says, Wounded? She can barely limp up and down the side of a spire on a tether, up and down, kind of like a winch system. She's no longer an airship. She's barely a windlass. She's barely something that can lift heavy objects. Like, so is this kind of like a, I kind of a man, and I don't know. I, I, I don't know what the reason behind the, the title of the book is, but from what I'm thinking is like the aeronauts win. What do you think it means? I'm thinking we're going to get something along the lines of, you you know, the characters that we have training right now. Yeah. They're going to become part of Grimm's crew and they're going to become the aeronauts and that ship's going to be the windlass. That lifts, lifts up their heavy weight. That lifts them up. It's like, it's like, it almost comes off to me as a joke. Like it's like the aeronauts windlass. Like, Hey, um, hey, Itasca, we're just about to escape from your ass. That's just a windlass, bro. That's the aeronauts yeah. windlass right there. But uh, I know, okay, hey, Rook, with your glorious, I can outrun you. I can outship you. You know what I mean? My crew is like old vets, but we're just a windlass, bro. We're the aeronauts windlass. Don't worry about yeah, us. We ain't, we, ain't, we ain't nothing. But so you, to me, that's can't. what it comes off as. It's kind of like a joke. Like this is the aeronauts windlass, the freaking predator with the core crystal from the Lancasters that 
Rook wants to get because it's like one of the rarest things ever that took two centuries to grow. Anyway. Yeah, I when I hear stuff like that, about how long it takes to make these crystals, I think, no wonder they're priceless. Like, it takes forever. Do we have anything in our world that takes 200 years? So how about some of those giant sequoia trees? Yeah, that's true. You know, like the ones you can actually drive a car through? They're so big. Those are like you know thousands of years old, I think. But remember, we learned about those when we were in uh, like middle school. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I, I remember, remember middle school a couple weeks ago. Me too. Back to the chapter. Um, Rook's words about Predator being lame really pisses Grim off. Rook pushes him over the edge, though, with the threat of taking him to court on grounds of criminal behavior reported by other spires, which Grimm admits to but explains that he incurred those accusations while acting in the fleet's behalf, which Rook is quick to uh, remind him that even under oath, he would still have to deny fleet al- uh, affiliation out of his original um, orders, duty, what do you call that, oath? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you can't say, like, yeah, I was working for the fleet when I was doing all these criminal activities. You have to deny it, even though he's not in the fleet anymore. So Rook's basically saying, checkmate, bro. Um, yeah, you have to deny it, so you're going to be drummed up on charges. Um, so that, even if he told the truth, that the fleet would, uh, wouldn't would back one man if it hurt their reputation. So even if Grimm spills the beans and says exactly what happened that it was for the fleet and all this the fleet would have to deny it themselves so even if he didn't uphold his oath he's still he's like double screwed and lastly he smiles as he says he will have that crystal one way or another i'm gonna find you i'm gonna get you get you get you i'm sorry i'll be quiet grim nods thoughtfully at this at this like uh you know, this point that he's going to be taken to courts. And then sure. slaps Commodore Rook hard across the face. The noise I of the slap echoing through the corridor. Rook was stunned more from the act than the actual hit. And Grimm tells him he doesn't see Predator as property, but uh, his home. He doesn't see the crewmen as his employees, but his family. And if Rook threatens to take that from him, he will kill him. It's like... Ooh. Oh, I actually Ooh. said that when I when I was listening yeah, to it, too. reading along. I was like, "Oh shit!" Because this my whole actual, time, yeah, go ahead. My actual reaction was, I was reading. I actually set the book down. I was like, "Oh shit, it's on!" Oh shit, shit. Oh shit. shit. Yeah, you know? yeah, I know it's there. Oh man, yeah, I was like pumped because it's like they've been so prim and proper this whole time, and Rook is basically spitting in his face, and finally, Grim's like, "Ah, f it." You, you say you're going to take me to court and you're going to take my core crystal. And what I really like is that he says, this isn't my ship. This isn't mine. This is my home. These aren't my crewmen. These aren't my employees. These are my, this is my family. And if you threaten either of those, you're oh, fucking yeah. done, dog. If it's between I them it. or you. I love it. So Rook is enraged because he just got slapped at Grimm's disrespect. Calls you know him what a- this reminds me of? Yep. Yeah. Remember when we went to that WWE show, that wrestling show? Yes. That's what this reminds me of. Two dudes. You're coming for my title on Friday. I'm going to whip your ass. And then the guy comes back. Oh, yeah. Pops him with a microphone. And then they go back and forth a little bit. Like, dude, I mean, it's very wrestling like that. Come on. It, it is very much like that. It's <laughs> very entertaining. Dude, do you still have that, that footage of me that got on the commercial? Guys, um, somehow I, mean, I got on a WWE commercial. It was awesome. It's permanently on wwe can you do a screen cap of that <laughs> at some point maybe send that yes. my way that'd be awesome because i it's i awesome. would love it's to cool. see that anyway uh so rook's in, enraged at grim's disrespect and calls him an arrogant insect and asks do you think you can slap me without paying for it you know in answer grim takes a yeah. quick step forward and slaps him hard again echoing again and we get this wonderful checkmate of a response from the g-man himself you gonna read it no i, I got it i got it you get me i'll do it any damn time i please sir grim said in the same level voice take me to court let me tell the judges and the public record precisely what incensed me enough to strike you you will be publicly humili- humiliated. 
If you hope to keep any shred of your reputation, you would have no choice but to accept to challenge me to a duel. And as the challenged party, I would insist upon the protocol mortis. Oh, shit. Okay, that's when I said, oh, shit. Because we get this... We get this reference to a dual situation again. So it's not just for kids. It's not just for the trainees. No. This is like people do duels. And basically what he's telling Rook is, go ahead, take me to court, motherfucker. I slapped you twice. So now I'm going to have to explain. I'm going to have to explain to him why I slapped you twice. And then you're going to be embarrassed and you're going to have to challenge me, making me the challenged party giving me the right to call the terms, which I call protocol mortis mo fuck. And so what is that? We don't know what that is. We don't know what protocol mortis is, but you're a man of words. What do you think like mortis is? If I heard protocol mortis, I think that protocol. Yeah, I think same I, thing. I would, think, I would think it's a duel to the death. Yeah. Mortis. Um, Somebody it, be dying. Yeah, Mortem in Latin means dead. So same thing. I imagine this is a duel to the death. So Rook says, you wouldn't dare. He says that to him. You wouldn't dare. Uh, that his family would have his hide, would have Grimm's hide. And Grimm says that he would change his flag to Olympia. He's like, all right, I'll change my flag to Olympia. That's another spire. Oh, Justin, you still there? Okay, got choppy there for a second. But anyway, he says, I'll change my flag to Olympia. They'd be happy to have me. And Rook calls him out and says that's treason. But Grimm reminds him that it would be treason for an officer of the fleet, which he is not because you've been telling me this whole time I'm not. It's like so good. This back and forth. And we get to hear about Olympia. And it's like another spire, you know. And the fact that they would be happy to have them tells me that, you know, there's the rules of the spires. It it gives you a, a broader picture of the world that gets me excited because it's like, you know that Grimm's been out there with Predator and has gone up against or fought with Olympian fleets, and they respect him. They're like, oh, that's Predator. That's our boy Grimm. We, we hang out at the tavern sometimes. <clears throat> when you hear stuff like this, you get the sense that there's more to this world than we've seen, and it makes you want more. Mm-hmm. Good writing. Great really writing. Good writing. So Rook calls him out and says, that's treason. Yeah, we know that. Um you wouldn't dare, you little bitch. You um, wouldn't dare. The pair throw more insulting threats at each other, and Grimm ends it by saying, if anything happens to his men, their families, or anything, he will denounce him to the Admiralty and the Council within the hour. And in the duel that follows, he will kill him. Grimm pointed a finger at him and said, stay away from my home, stay away from my family, good day, sir. Then the captain of the Predator turned precisely on a heel and continued marching toward the palace. I see that as like a very... Uh, remember when we went to the Tomb of the Unto- Unknown Soldier when we went to D.C.? Yep. Uh, I see that as being like a very military, like... Very on the sharp. Heel, like, yep. That's how I saw it, yeah. Smartly, cool. like smartly saluting, you know? Yep, yep. Um, and I also like... We get some more freaking world building here. He's going to denounce if, if he does anything to his men their families or anything he's going to denounce them to the admiralty okay i guess we got an admiralty and the council like okay so then there's like a layer called the council which is probably the council of aeronauts that have to decide okay you didn't really do something good here we got to put you up against the council. you know what i mean so it's like the fact that he can do that and still has those connections it's like there's a whole nother freaking world it's so intriguing because we see, all we've seen of Grimm so far is him as the captain, which he was very capable of doing. But now he's also the captain logistically and still remembers all the shit, still has the connections to the Admiralty, to the um, to the council, to the, knows all the intricate details that makes him an excellent captain. And it's like, why did this mo? Why did he get drummed out? Because it's he seems like the perfect captain, and he's like you said, loyal and everything. Yeah, it makes me makes me wonder. So can we get a round of applause uh, for Captain it's Francis awesome. Madison Grimm? Everybody. Holy shit. I thought we can we get a round of applause for great writing from Jim Butcher. Hey. Good job, Jimmy. Uh, That's what that is. There are so many themes at play in this scene that we could uh, dissect, but the main one I want to applaud is one that you pointed out, 
is Grimm's family bond and loyalty. He will stop at nothing to protect his home and his crew. And I think that's awesome. The, the, you know, um, there's a lot of things that you could, you could say happen in this scene as themes of him dealing with a fall from grace, you know, being pointed at like that, dealing with, um, uh, the types of like manners in society being civilized versus uncivilized. But I really like his family bond and loyalty that really shines in yes. this first part of the chapter. Absolutely. So, uh, continuing with the chapter, Grimm hadn't walked alone for two minutes before hearing a calm, amused voice coming from the darkness. What's happened to you, Mad? You want to read that? Yeah. What's happened to you, Mad? You've acquired a few new shreds of discretion. I remember a time when you would have braced that pompous twit in the middle of the Havel market at noonday. Grim snorted and didn't slow his steps. Ah, I have no time to fence with you, Bayard. So I like this. I, we, go, we go from one smart-ass interaction to another smart-ass interaction. You get the impression, like, all three at some point of these dudes have all had interactions. Mm -hmm. And uh, who are we interacting with? We're inter interacting with Bayard, a guy named Bayard. Bayard, Bayard, yeah. And from the book, right underneath that, that sentence that you read, there's a description of him. Can you read that? It starts with a small, sure. slender figure. Yeah. A small, slender figure of a man appeared from the gloom and fell into step beside him. Alexander Bayard wore a commander's... Commander's? Commodore. Commodore's uniform, almost precisely like Rook's, if not quite as richly fashioned. It was also a great deal more weather-worn. Bayard loved to spend his days aboard ship out on the dock of his flag vessel. The heavy cruiser... Valiant, whereas Rook hid from the elements whenever he could. So that's a wonderful. Character, Go ahead. Character details, character description, without bashing you over the head with it. They tell you a lot about the people just with that sentence. Like, look, Baird, he likes to be out there in the elements. He's rough and tumble. Let's do it. Get it. Rook, kind of a little pussy. Yeah. You... But see, see how Rook proved that already? By trying to, I'll take you to court. Like, you don't want to fight. You don't want to fight Grim. He wants to take him to court. Wow. I didn't even think about that angle. Look at how, just look the at, same look way. Look at how much information we just got. Wow. Just in the same way that if, if Bayard in the Valiant had to fight Rook in the Glorious, Rook would be in the captain's chamber giving out orders indirectly. Whereas Bayard, we get the impression that he'd be right out there holding onto a rope and being like, get that let's guy, go, get that guy, go, uh, shoot number two etheric cannon at that guy. You yeah, know what I mean? That's exactly it. Yes, yes. And that just, all that does is it continues to build these characters and these personalities that we haven't had a lot of interaction with yet. But look at how much we know about these characters from a few pages. And another a thing, when we, or when we were introduced to Rook, Jim said, uh, you know, what was, well, it was his, well, I forget what his full name was, but it was, yeah, yeah. he you. put Commodore yeah. right in the beginning. Let's see here. Commodore something Rook. And we just got Alexander Bayard now. Yeah. Commodore Hamilton Rook. And exactly. That's what I'm pointing out yeah. is yeah. he's, Alexander Baird. he's introduced as Baird. Alexander Baird who wore a Commodore's uniform almost precisely the same. So, He's in the fleet too, and he also knows Grimm. And what's interesting here is he says, well, how does he introduce? He says, what's happened to you, Mad? Mad, that's in reference to uh, Madison. Madison, his middle name. So it's not that Grimm dislikes his names. He just doesn't consider Rook a motherfucking friend. Do you know what I'm saying? And that you would call your friend Mad? He took it from me. Or... Or, like you said, it's a friendship thing. Or it could be a reference to Francis Madison Grimm being a fucking madman. Yes, because think about it. His name in this context would be Mad Grimm. He's Mad Grimm. That's like the madman. Mad, Mad, Mad Madison. Like, it's it's a cool name. You like When you're introduced to it from Rook's perspective, you're like, oh, he's calling him Francis. He's calling him Madison. But when you're introduced to it from Bayard's perspective, he's mad. That's cool. 
two similar conversations. Yep. Spoiler alert. Two similar conversations. Two totally different people. Two totally different perspectives of the exact same person. Yes. So, like um, after Grimm warns the Commodore, don't make me duel you, the text describes Bayard further, citing that he had glittering eyes and hair that had gone magnificently silver decades before its time. So this character uh, truly is a sharp contrast to Rook. So instead of, you know, having the affectation of dyeing his hair jet black to make himself look cool, he let it go gray and silver or whatever. Magnificently silver. Decades before its time. So he probably started going gray when he was like 29 or something like that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so it kind of gives you this idea of like, this guy is just cool with himself. He knows who himself is. You know yeah. what I mean? He's ba- not trying to be something. Not. You're right. Bayard also adds that if they were to duel, the winner would be himself. And they both know it saying Ooh. Bayard would beat Grimm and they both, but Bayard's got some confidence, right? Yeah. And see, he's kind of picking at Grimm a little bit, yeah. but it's more of a friendly pick. At. Yes. It's not prickish like um rooks was so there's already a difference in tone between these two i i like bayard right away yeah and grim doesn't refute it he doesn't say like yeah i'd beat you bayard does give grim credit for being a true tradesman of violence but with the caveat that he has no ice in his soul and not a speck of reptile in his blood it's a little too nice grim is like you just called yourself a reptile and starts kind of laughing at him you know what i mean like dude you just called yourself a reptile bro because he's picking back because they're friends and which to which he is um uh grim is like you just call yourself a, a reptile and bayard says yeah i am um which is why he's still in uniform and grim is not so saying i'm a cold-blooded reptile bro that's why i'm still in uniform and unfortunately you are not we then learn from grim that he alone took the fall when both of them could have been drummed out and he doesn't hold it against bayard we still but don't know what happened. Bayard holds it against himself. Correct. Um, we still don't know what happened to cause Grimm to get kicked from the fleet. Uh, Bayard says not to worry anymore about Rook, but if it does come to a duel, to please ask him to be his second. Like, dude, if you do duel Rook, like, don't worry about that guy. He's slimy, whatever. But if you do have to duel him, please ask me to be your second, bro. I'd love... Ooh. To yep. watch you whip his ass. Yep. We get some we get some really cool kind of sundere back and forth here. For those of you that don't know what that is, it's an anime term. And uh, so we, I'll read this for you. What, what is that? Anime? Isn't that those cartoons that for anime? kids? That's some cartoons for kids. Uh, you needn't. I'll do it for you. As for Rook, Bayard shuddered. If it comes to a duel, I hope you call upon me to be your second. I find it unlikely I should be so desperate, Grimm said. I suppose if everyone else says no. I may consider you. And I imagine him saying Baka as he said that. And I'm just like, ah, oh, Christ. Back to my anime days now. Well, I like that you you listed that part because I this also is an excellent scene um, that really portrays Bayard's unique character. He's not just an extra Commodore that we get to meet that's one of Grimm's old buddies. We actually get to see more. Um, you get an inside look at this relationship. You get an inside look at Bayard and kind of what kind of person he is. He's so far, what we've known from him is he was able to slink up on Grimm almost undetected. He is a self-proclaimed ice blooded reptile, you know, and claims that he can beat Grimm in a fight because he is that way, because he is sly, because he's that kind of thing. And Grimm didn't argue. And Grimm didn't argue. But we also get to see this awesome, warm side of him. And I'm going to read that from the book, too. So it comes off right after what you said. So Grimm said, I suppose if everyone else says no, I may consider you. Excellent. A day in advance at least, if you please. My mistress would never understand if I walked out on her abruptly. Grimm barked out a laugh. Neither of you is married. And you've been seeing each other exclusively for 11 years now? 13. 13. Bayard said smugly, <laughs> God in heaven. And you, and yet you persi- persist in this fiction that she is your mistress even now? Why? A boyish grin spread over Bayard's face. Because scandal, old friend, is ever so much more enjoyable than propriety. Such things are the spice of life. 
You degenerate, Grimm said, but he was smiling widely now, and the rage and frustration he had felt in it at his encounter with Rook had faded away. How is it, Abigail? Rosy-cheeked, starry-eyed, and content, my friend. She sends her love. I love that. I absolutely loved that. That's some good shit. We, we basically learn that Bayard has this mistress that's actually basically just his girlfriend that he's been seeing for 13 years exclusively. But he just they, they keep this game going because it's fun for them because they're both probably fucking weird. And Grimm... She loves it. Likes to be and, slapped. and not only that, but Grim knows knows this woman and says, "How is Abigail?" You know, they they are they've had dinner before. You know what I mean? And he says, yeah. "You know what? Yeah, she's rosy cheeked, starry eyed, and content, my friend. She sends her love, being like, "Hey, if you see, you know that they had that conversation before breakfast. Like, oh, I heard Grim's back in town. I heard Predator's pretty beat up. Hey, if you see him, make sure you send my love, okay?" And he's like, "You got it, mistress." And then they part ways. It's wonderful. So Grimm asks Commodore Alex Bayard to send his warmest regards back to Abigail, then says thanks. Bayard basically tells him not to sweat it, that Rook would try the patience of an archangel, and reminds Grimm that he does have friends out here. Being like, hey man, I know you're doing this like loner thing, but like, dude, we there are some people out here that are actually your friends. Which is nice. It makes you kinda it kind of gives you like a a a breath of fresh air like okay we're back in spire albion and it's not so hostile as we think you know what i mean yeah, like for sure we got some old homies here the two make it into a dim section of the largely unused tunnel the looming crystals are more spread out and grim has to put a hand on the wall to help guide his nearly blind footsteps he asked bayard why he found him in the first place that it must not have been because he needed more, a morale boost Bayard says that they need to speak to the Spire Arc, which Grimm tells him that's where he was heading. So he's like, wait, like, like, why, how, why did you find me in the first place, bro? As they're walking into a darker and darker part of the, remember, we're in the ventilation tunnels. Mm-hmm. The, the same place that last chapter we heard Cat report from the, you know, from the silent pause, like, yo, there's shit in the tunnels. You know what I mean? So we're walking into it. It's getting darker. The lumen crystals are getting more spread out. It's like, why'd you find me? I'm heading I'm heading to the palace myself to talk to Spirearch. And that's what Bayard says to him. He's like, hey, man, you need to talk to Spirearch. And he's like, well, I was just heading there. Uh, and then Bayard reveals that Spirearch isn't in his manor, that he sent Bayard to fetch Grimm and bring him to his location. Ooh, fancy and this is a surprise all in itself. Like, why isn't the Spirearch at home? And then the chapter ends in a very suspenseful way. Yeah, what the hell, dude? This was crazy. Bayard stopped abruptly in his tracks. Grim followed suit almost instantly. Like, they're practiced at, you know, like, not practiced, but instinctual. They're good teammates kind of thing. Yeah, yeah the, like, they know what's up. The tunnel was full of, wi- of a whispering sound. The echoes of their steps, of their voices, the distant, empty exhale of air moving through the spire's vents and their own breath. Grimm was never sure after what tiny hiccup of sound or what flicker of motion in the gloom gave the ambush away. His instincts simply screamed that danger was at hand, and he drew his sword in a liquid whisper of copper-clad steel. Beside him, he felt as much as heard Bayard do the same. And then something, some thing, shrieked in the dark, and a cannonball of howling hot agony hurtled into his chest. Yeah. End I, of chapter seven. Yeah, when I read that, because I, I think I'm a chapter or two ahead now. Oh, so you got past the next chapter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I When I first read that, I was like, is this dude dead? Yeah. A, a cannonball of howling hot agony hurtled into his chest. I thought he'd gotten shot, blasted from them crystal gauntlets or something. That's what it seems almost like. But I really like how... Uh, Grim wasn't sure what hiccup or sound or feeling of motion or whatever, but he quickly draws out his sword and he feels Bayard do the same, who had just kind of, they had both gotten ready back to back and then boom, they're ready. This yeah. is so cool because they're going from a conversation that was actually like warm hearted, like uh, really nice to, hey, why are you here? I need to go to the Spire Arc. And then we was, then uh, Bayard's like, dude, Spire Arc isn't at 
the palace. And so then it also, now you start to get like conspiracy on it. It's like, well, why isn't he there? Like, why did Bayard get sent by the Spire Arc? And before you can even start to dwell on that, now we get ambushed. And I don't know. It, it really reminded me of like a Luthien and uh homie. Yeah. Oh, God. Why can't I think of his name? It's not it's not Regis. That's from Forgotten Realms. Uh, Oliver de Barros. Oliver de Barros. It reminded me of like a Luthien Oliver situation a little bit where they both go back to back and they're ready to rock. But um, that's that's chapter seven, my man. What did you think of it? I loved it. This was probably the best chapter of the book so far for me. I told you this already. I like character interactions. I like character development. doesn't always have to have action. This chapter was loaded with character interactions, personality, and excitement. And we even got a little action right at the end. Um, this chapter was a very easy read for me to the point to where I looked up and I was like, oh, I'm done. Oh, let's do the next one. Like this chapter, was, I would say out of the book so far was my favorite. Yeah, same. Um, I just I love, love Grant, I, dude. As, as much as Rook is a prick, I do like that pompous, arrogant character. There is something about that that makes me go, uh. <laughs> I like both these guys. Uh, I mean, yeah, I know Rook cool. is an asshole, but you know he's a good com- Commodore. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know he's in the fleet when and he's... When you're good, you're good. Period. End of discussion. And seeing the... the seeing the different... Uh, how would I word this? Like the different kinds of people that can reach the rank of Commodore, whether it's through their skill, through their uh, tacticalness, you know, like obviously Rook is a strategy guy. And then obviously uh, Bayard is a sneaky guy, but they both have risen to Commodore, which we can assume that Grim was at, or he was with them like a step below or as they were coming up in ranks. You know what I mean? Which he was probably well on his way to becoming. And, mm-hmm. um, you just get this, this feeling like, okay, the fleet will take anybody who's good. Like if you can, the cream rises to the top, the cream rises to the top. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But Grim has been kicked out and it makes me think of like, I want to hear the story of Grimm when he was in the Academy. You know what I mean? With Bayard and Rook. And like they were bunking together and they're like, dude, what if we did this? What if we did that? And Rook's sitting there in the corner being like, "Um, I'm going to send someone to go like kick the tray out from underneath this person. Meanwhile, you know, Bayard sneaks up on you. He's like, dude, they got pizza for lunch today. Like, where'd you come from, Bayard? What the heck? Uh, Bayard reminds me uh, he would be like Ron Weasley. You think so? Ron Weasley? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Rod, dude, Ron Weasley's not a bitch character. He just is treated like it. Harry! Harry! He does, he does plenty of good things in the movies and the books. Come on. The books, he's he's pretty he's pretty cool. He, he reminds, like I said, he reminds uh, The books are better than the movies. Oh, shut up. And uh, <laughs> Grimm kind of reminds me of Harry. And, uh, you know, I guess if you need a Draco Malfoy, it's Rook. Hmm. Yeah, I don't. I don't agree with that at all. <laughs> that's cool. Hey, we all got problems. That's yeah, that's fine. I would say, like, for Harry Potter, I would say that's more of like a Gwen. Uh, Ron Weasley would be more of like um, Bridget. Uh, <laughs> Malfoy would be more Raoul. But you know, could you know, because Malfoy always runs away. Like he, there's oh, gonna that's be like true. a big fight, and Malfoy runs away. He's always talking about. So that would be. Like, oh, um, they get you. That would be Reginald. You know, he kind of reminds me of Rook. I see what you're saying. Yeah, you know, like I'm gonna, my daddy's gonna get you. Yes. You know, yes. Like, okay, I'm with you like, now. And you, see you where know, I'm going with that though? yep. And Malfoy comes from a full-blooded family, the true way, you know. And he actually does know shit. Like as much as he's a jerk, he does know fucking dark magic, dude. Mm-hmm. At least Snape would say that. Okay, you know what? What house? What house are you? If you were, I'm a Slith- I'm a Slith- I'm a Slithendor. Okay, 
10 points to Slithendor. You Let's turned go. me. You turned me around on that one. Great Let's answer. It's not, the, it's not the first time I turned you around. Dan. Hey yo. Okay, with that, guys. <laughs> thanks for listening to Random Book Club podcast. Catch you next time. Peace.